Hello everyone, and welcome to the Intoxicated Arts Appreciation Society, where we're ticking all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the way you can hear a beer can in the first <laughs> 10 seconds. Bro, we're off to the winky, so you gotta keep going. Okay. How are you doing today, Josh? I'm doing great. Uh... I just, I just had my first, you know, day back at uni, and um, I'm feeling the real kind of academic buzz around me, and I'm ready to have a really high-minded, intellectual discussion of Avengers: Infinity War plus Endgame. So, we borrowed the Mind Stone off J Cole for a bit. So, yeah, yeah, we got the J Cole Mind Stone right now, dude. I am Matty. Uh, I lead the film discussions, and Josh leads the film discussions. So music, I need the music discussions. So. Oh, yeah, that that's it. <laughs> so yeah, like Josh said, uh, we'll be talking about the last two Avengers movies, Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. And uh, yeah, obviously these are hugely significant moments in film history. Uh, Avengers Endgame is probably going to end up being the highest grossing movie of all time. Uh, already rising to, I think, the 18th spot within its opening weekend it's pretty crazy yeah it's yeah. pretty crazy um so uh josh what's your history with uh these movies and the marvel cinematic universe as a whole that's coming to an end okay well the first marvel cinematic universe movie i saw in cinema was iron man 2008 i was eight years old and my dad took me to watch it and it was fucking amazing i'll never forget the end of that movie when he says, um, I'm Iron Man, and then fucking ACDC plays, and I'm an eight-year-old, and I'm like, yo, that was the best film ever, right? And then since then, you know, I remember seeing Avengers uh, in year seven or so, huge event. Uh, it's weird looking back, that feels so small compared to what we're dealing with now, but back then it was like a huge fucking deal. And since and since Avengers, I've basically been dragged kicking and screaming by my friend Kieran through the entire MCU. Uh, every year, like free MCU films come out. I don't want to watch any of them, and Kieran kind of forces me. And uh, I'm I'm actually grateful for that now because it it gave me <laughs> it gave me the proper like education to deal with Endgame. Adam Hamley got to be part of this like huge cinematic event. So that that's basically my experience. Like mostly reluctant, but every now and then there was a great film like Ragnarok or Winter Soldier that made it worth it. But... Yeah, I'm kind of similar actually. I you know, there have obviously been standout movements across the years, uh that being I think Guardians and Thor Ragnarok as well. Um but yeah, a large part of the MCU for me has been a bit dull and obviously always of a certain level of quality, which I do appreciate, um, especially given the movie landscape nowadays. But yeah, there was a certain reluctance. Yeah, that, that, that being said, I do think the last two years have been pretty consistently great though. Oh, totally. Yeah. Instead of it being mostly generic with a few standout ones, it's now actually mostly pretty standout and of a pretty high quality with a couple of like lesser ones that are, are still just fine mm. um, so i guess we might as well get on into the actual uh discussion part of it um i know josh's thoughts on uh, infinity war already i saw infinity war very late i actually watched it i think two weeks ago now mm. so uh uh, yeah, just to come right out and say it, um, Avengers Infinity War is my favourite Marvel movie. Um, Damn, look at her go. I didn't even have a good time with Infinity War. I had a great time, obviously. Even what the, what the previous best Marvel movies for me did, this one just elevated it. It did things with Marvel movies that I just never, ever, honestly, believed could be done. Hmm. And it was fantastic. Honestly, it was so great. And I can't wait to talk about this for just ages and ages. Honestly, I'm really happy to you say that because, um, yeah, I was really impressed by Infinity War as well when it came out. And the way I watched Endgame was I caught a double bill in the cinema, Infinity War and then followed by Endgame. 
And I really fucking enjoyed Infinity War again. Like it held up on rewatch, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just really happy to hear you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, there was a <clears throat> there was a lot of build up, I guess, to me actually watching it and you hearing what I thought. Um, I mentioned in the last episode that we'll probably do a sort of intermingled discussion about the two films. I hope that's okay. Mm. Because they are just so inextricably linked. They're essentially... I wouldn't I would say it's uh, as simplistic as, as two parts. I think yeah. they work as their own story. I think it's interesting because I do think they are very like distinct films. Like I think they're definitely two different stories. But at the same time, I do feel like plot threads that are brought up in Infinity War are resolved in Endgame. Like Infinity War, when it goes to the heroes, it starts with Tony Stark talking to Pepper Potts about the wedding, right? And then Endgame kind of resolves that whole family storyline. In a way that was surprising, I, I was honestly expecting Endgame to like end with the wedding or something, but the way it just jumps... Oh, spoilers, by the way! Holy shit, there are spoilers in this podcast. Anyway, um, but if you haven't seen Endgame yet, then, you know, you, I mean, you you don't deserve to not be spoiled. <laughs> but yeah, um, but no, no, I was really surprised at uh, how quickly they resolved the Pepper Potts, Tony Stark marriage thing. But yeah, like you said, I do agree. I think, I think these films are best and thought of as basically the same film, uh, as opposed to completely separate films. But I think an argument can be made for the narratives being quite distinct mm, totally so yeah let's get right on into it as a as a whole discussion um so infinity war for me was so great because never have i felt the stakes of a marvel movie so strongly and that's not just because the universe is being threatened again the universe has always been threatened in these marvel movies that's how it works um and it's even not just because of its ruthless uh, murdering of characters very earlier on and in very shocking ways. It's really because of an incredible character um, and also because of some amazing cinematography and editing that really grounds you in this conflict and makes it terrifying because it does feel so real in a way that I don't feel even out of my favorite Marvel movies has ever been done before. I really was anxious watching this film and this was in a room like with my friends, you know, ha all having a really good time watching it, but it really just was tense and at every moment, even though I knew the ending, I was clinging to every piece of action, the stakes were really there for me. And to come into Endgame, I, I did really enjoy Endgame overall. Um, I probably have... Uh, more problems with it than I do Infinity War, and I don't like it quite as much. Um, for, but I'll definitely get into that. But wow, also, what a satisfying and amazing end for a saga that at some points I've really been ambivalent about. The reason I didn't see Infinity War was because I didn't care about these Marvel movies anymore. But what both these films achieve in doing is making me look back in fondness and really very strongly sentimentally back at this long list of films. And that's just a fantastic achievement in itself. And the fact that they work at mo work as movies at all on their own is amazing. I find it hard to go with you. I, I can't think of Endgame and Affinity War as anything but two sides of the same coin. Like, I think that... I agree with you. I think Infinity War is incredible and an amazing achievement, but I do think that Endgame had a lot more on its plate. Like, all Infinity War had to do, really, was make Thanos an interesting character, which it did fantastically. But Endgame had to, like, wrap up 11 years of story. <laughs> um, both conclude the plot threads of Infinity War, while also every other MCU movie and give like a satisfying send off. And I do think like the way Endgame uses its time travel advice to basically do what has been called in journals as a, a kind of victory run, 
was a genius kind of idea of how to do a final film. So I, I do genuinely see them as equals, but just good for very different reasons. Um, to speak more on Infinity War, um, I totally agree. I think the stakes in this film were incredible. And one thing that took me by surprise was there's so many kind of like elevated artsy moment of the movie, which felt sort of up to interpretation or like vaguely challenging. So you're very used to kind of Marvel movies being kind of very easy to go down. Whereas Infinity War, there were moments where I was genuinely like confused or kind of perplexed generally like in, in the direction it was going. Like for example, uh, probably my, I don't know, there's so many great moments. Maybe my favorite moment in Infinity War is right at the end after Thanos kind of clicks his fingers. Um, instead of sh- just immediately showing all of the kind of destruction that he's caused, it goes to show him using the Soul Stone to see young Gamora, right? And like the first time I watched this, I didn't fully connect the what I was seeing with the Soul Stone. I didn't fully understand what was going on. But it's a great like psychedelic, cerebral moment of remorse and reflection for Thanos that gave his character so much shocking depth that I just wouldn't have expected. And like for a huge budget super movie, I wouldn't expect him to handle the moment where the villain wins in such a tender, nuanced way. I think that's what makes Infinity War so great. Uh, it, it's nuanced. Uh, and I'd argue the same for Endgame, honestly. Um, that's what makes these films so shocking. There was a kind of a heart and a attention to detail that I wouldn't expect from films to the scope. Yeah, in Infinity War, there's never a moment where you doubt just how uh, well-rounded he is as a character. While he has a really interesting motivation, he just has a very strong emotional core. And while that's using a sort of uh, a sort of foil character in a way with Gamora and how he cares about her, it's how their relationship has been developed over time. And strangely enough, the performance that honestly just makes you buy it every single second and you almost feel like he's never acting without while maybe not the best interest for her in mind he is definitely always acting with her in his mind in a way Mm. i guess um this is where kind of my complaints come in with endgame um and there i think there are definite uh rebuttals against this like the fact that it is less about thanos but in Endgame, I found Thanos just remarkably less interesting. Um, and it, yeah, again, it's not a film about him, but even I I didn't feel as threatened or as fearful of him as I did in Infinity War. Every time in Infinity War like, where a scene would start with him like sort of teleporting in, I was like, oh God, what's he going to do now? Whereas in this one, I don't know. I felt like... Uh, the fear of that came from his character and the emotional side of his character was kind of gone for good reason i suppose but that r- did make the film feel just less urgent and significant to me okay well uh, i i really like endgame and i want to defend it from everyone currently um so uh to to confront your criticism about thanos and endgame um, this is a common criticism I've seen online, uh, both in the Red Letter Media video and in the um, Your Movie Sucks video. Uh, uh, people talk about how the Thanos that appears at the end of Endgame is a fundamentally different Thanos, right? Like, he didn't experience the events of Infinity War, and therefore this takes away the emotional impact of defeating him. I, I totally understand if you're responding to that, but I actually don't align with that so much. I don't. I actually don't think that's something you can like criticize the film for. Um, I just. I just think merely like an execution. It's not that interesting. Mm. I don't think there's anything well, even... wrong with showing a Thanos that isn't from it, the Thanos we know from Infinity War. He can, he still has those motivations. Well, from an interview I watched with the Russo brothers, they explained that um, Infinity War is definitely a Thanos film, and it's told from his point of view. So you're going to get a very nuanced, deep kind of portrayal of his motives, right? Whereas, it, obviously, in the interview, they wouldn't reveal whose point of view um, Endgame is from, because it was before it came out. But we can basically assume it's from the Avengers' point of view, right? Yeah, and I think Endgame 
intentionally gives us a more simplistic view of the villain without the baggage of the events of Infinity War in order to show, in order to make a point about um, the futility of revenge and also what is cathartic about winning for a cause that you believe in. I'd actually agree with you. The triumph in this film isn't so much actually defeating Thanos. It's kind of an afterthought. The The most triumphant moment in this film is when everyone is brought back. And that's, yeah, because it's less actually about beating a villain rather than just saving people. Yeah. I think in Endgame, the villain isn't Thanos. Uh, it's actually the Avengers themselves. It's their personal arcs. Um like you said, in the end, the victory isn't defeating him. The victory, in my opinion, is Tony Stark's character development coming to full fruition. It's the moment when he does a truly selfless act. Um, this is his entire character arc. And this is characterized as well as in Thor, the entire film's about him dealing with failure. Um, Black Widow, the entire film deals with her dealing with like retribution for things she's done. The the villains are the end are the are the Avengers themselves dealing with their own kind of imperfections, their flaws, and coming to terms of their character arcs. And I think like this has been, in my opinion, really overlooked in criticism of endgame I, I don't think many people are talking about how well it actually dealt with concluding character arcs that have been running for a decade or so um if you mind can i get into kind of the general online criticism of the film yeah absolutely and we can come right back around to talking about the film themselves soon go ahead i feel like the general criticism from popular youtubers is the time travel element so Every kind of review that has like a negative thing about it seems to be talking about the time travel. Uh, this was characteristic in the YMS video, the Red Letter Media video, and I see Muffets. So I haven't watched all of them. But I, I think while there are issues potentially with the time travel film, I think it, the film does enough to explain away these issues where they're not even that really big of a problem. I don't give a shit about time travel rules. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, while there are issues, I feel like all of these all of these critics kind of failed to acknowledge the thematic kind of successes of the movie, and I think this is a problem with online criticism of film in general. People seem to treat films as if they're sciences, so like this is logically inconsistent, therefore it's bad, but they never really take into consideration like metaphor, right? For example, you can criticize the logistics of how Captain America is able to come back at the end of Endgame, but you're completely ignoring the thematic arc of Captain America, the kind of great subversion of a character arc, where this is a character who did nothing wrong, he does not need retribution, and he is rewarded for his virtue. And this is that moment thematically for that. And this is a film all about rewarding people for their virtue, for being good. And no one's talking about this. And it's extremely frustrating. There's, I, I, I really just like this kind of angle of criticism that people have taken over this film. I definitely share your passions of, yeah, films being criticised purely logically. My main issue with that kind of thing is, at the end of the day, what's more entertain, going to be more entertaining? A film that is completely logically sound, but without, with basically all nuance and character stripped away. Or... A film that just sort of transcends logical consistencies and just provides you with an impactful narrative and impactful character arcs. The moments at the end of Avengers Endgame were so powerful and so well wrapped up the last 11 years of filmmaking that essentially they could get away with anything in terms of logical inconsistencies because that is why I watch films. I watch films to be satisfied i watch films to have had an experience emotionally and that is what that provided logical inconsistencies are at the back of my mind in in those moments and i think if in those moments if you truly care about these characters in these films then logic and obviously there's a certain limit to this but logic really shouldn't be the forefront of your mind i totally agree and i think the Another thing I'm seeing in like 
how people are responding to this movie. It's obviously this is the biggest movie of the year, part of the biggest movie of, of all time. So you're going to get lots of people you want to feel like special, right? They, they're not part of the herd mentality that uh-huh. enjoys this film. Yeah, the hot take. And it really bothers me because it's this sort of like brand of criticism where it's like I was unaffected emotionally by this movie and I'm going to look at it logically and rationally and look at how the time travel works and all. And they don't fucking pay any attention to how much attention to detail was paid to emotionally resonant moments in the film as big as this, which they could have easily just had, like, you know, a huge CGI fest for three hours, but it generally everyone brings their A-game. The writers bring their A-game, the actors bring their A-game, and this is generally a really emotional, moving film. And uh, surprisingly, one of the only critics I've seen that, like, is huge YouTube, uh, who acknowledges this, is um, you know, Mark Commode. Mark Commode, he's great. Yeah. I love him. Known for being kind of one of the more staunch uh, reviewers, he he actually acknowledged, you know, I don't even really care about this universe, but this film did accomplish being emotionally resonant. The performances are really powerful. And this is something I think is just, I, I don't know, I don't like this kind of strong, ooh, look at me, I didn't cry when thingy happened. Like, I'm going to analyze the time travel instead. Like, you can't ignore how brilliantly executed uh, Black Widow's when she's almost crying, when she's thinking about what's become of Hawkeye, or Captain America, when you see him old, finally given that life he never got to have, or uh, Potts telling uh, Tony, like, you can rest now. Like, these are gorgeous, tender moments that he didn't need to include in the film, but they're just so well integrated that I think is being unrightfully ignored. I completely agree. And to hone in on this a bit, um, my favorite sort of character arc in the film was Iron Man's. Um, he has always sort of been the carrier of these films, um, obviously with his film kicking off the MCU. Um, and this really is a beautiful send off for him. I mean, just you talking about Potts telling him he can rest now, it genuinely almost brings me to tears. Um, it's like there's a moment in the beginning of the film when. Um, they come to him for help and uh, he just simply says, no, I have a fa- I have people I can't lose now. And I just found that to be such an interesting, relatable conflict. Just the idea that he just cannot risk what he has now. Just one off chance that maybe they can bring back everything. Like I just, it was such a, hard cut conflict that was so raw and well executed it just it was yeah it's genuinely one of my favorite moments in the whole film it was so interesting just to see someone purely acting out of love for their family um in 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 a big blockbuster movie that didn't feel overly saccharine and yeah he has an amazing character arc and the the fact that basically the last 10 minutes of this film is about him is kind of a reflection of how well executed it is. I, I totally agree. Um, I think in this film, first of all, he, so his whole arc throughout the entire saga is obviously being, he's a selfish arsehole, right? And he only thinks about himself. That's his entire arc throughout the entire saga. And you could have very simplistically gone for a, like, Obviously, he's selfish. Obviously, he's wrong. And when he kind of starts being selfish, it's going to be a very clear moment, right? But here, he's still being selfish, but we now understand his selfishness. He's being selfish because he wants to enjoy his family. Yeah. Despite the millions, billions of families who won't be happy if he doesn't help them, he wants his own. And as an audience, we can really connect with that and understand that. And it's a challenging moment. We have to decide, like, should we really expect him to give up his family? And it's a moment where his kind of selfishness arc becomes challenging, becomes palpable. And I did not expect that kind of depth from a film called Avengers Endgame, you know? Like, I, I, 
like you said, I'm just so incredibly impressed how this film went above and beyond what it was expected to do. Um, leading up to it, um, all I really knew about it was that there was going to be time travel. It was the one spoiler that I had. And it wasn't really a spoiler for me because it just made me more excited. So all I really wanted was crazy people in colorful suits traveling through time. <laughs> and I got so much more. And uh, I really think, like, yeah, okay, everyone in the fucking world is going to see this film, sure. But just because it's popular doesn't necessarily take away from its achievements, honestly. Uh, and I really think the Russo brothers just went above and beyond the Call of Duty in their approach to direction this. Honestly, yeah, God bless them for what they've done. I wouldn't like to have seen these last two films in anyone's in one other's hands. They they just have brought so much, and I'm so grateful for them. They've essentially um, recontextualized the entire MCU for me. They have made it feel so much more personal and genuine. And honestly, I, I, two years ago, I couldn't have cared less about it. Whereas now, I just, just all of these films are recontextualized with 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 stakes but also passion as well and it's fantastic yeah i looked i looked through to see like how many mcu films they directed i was so shocked to find it was only what this infinity war and uh civil war and which soldier i felt like they did the whole thing because of how well they understood what made it good if you know what i mean they it does feel like they've been here from the beginning because they just are so clearly passionate it's fantastic yeah and i think we should bring up like their background in tv so i've been watching arrested development recently and uh anthony russo directed a lot of that show as well as community and i think this kind of uh background in serialized television gave them a real sense of like how to reward fans for their loyalty you know to a property that's been running for a long time and how to treat characters how to say goodbye to characters that we've grown to love uh i didn't even fucking know i liked half of these characters until i watched Infinity <laughs> toward endgame you know i realized like oh my god like these they've made me love them <laughs> such a feat yeah and, and talk about the comedy in these films i think this isn't a new fresh criticism but i have to admit the comedy in infinity war really didn't work for me um I, I it was basically my least favorite aspect of the film i didn't think it was out of place really and not the, the the placement of jokes itself was absolutely fine but god some of them were just really not great um but Endgame luckily rectifies this. And I think that just because it had so much more room to have well-written comedy in it, I feel like Infinity War had so much else going on, whereas Endgame sort of told a, a less tense moment-to-moment -moment story than Infinity War, and so the comedy could really breathe. Um, I thought Infinity War's comedy was fine. Um... I really like the Thor Guardian of the Galaxy interactions. I think those are really funny. Um, what was it specifically that bothered you? I don't remember like many jokes other than the Guardian stuff. It was just they, I just don't think they were very well well written. A lot of them weren't um, very funny. Just a lot of I, I was watching this with my friends, and obviously the ones that landed, we were laughing out loud. But just a lot of them just had us sat in silence, really. Although there is a the very start of Endgame, Iron Man calls Nebula a blue meanie, <laughs> which is a reference to the animated Yellow Submarine film, which is amazing. <laughs> I didn't get that joke. I thought Endgame was, yeah, I agree, a lot funnier than Infinity War, which is really weird because when I thought to see the double bill, like Infinity War ends and it's such a fucking downer. Like, like even though I knew it ended that way, I was still like, holy shit, that was bleak, you know? Um, the end game starts. You're expecting like, oh, we're gonna like, kind of, be somber for an hour, and then you get that fucking like Iron Man moment where he sees Rocket Raccoon talk, and he's like, I swear to God, for like a minute there, I thought you were just a builder bear. That was so funny, like this. Endgame is so incredibly funny. Another thing no one's talking about, because we're not allowed to talk about good things when it comes to popular entertainment. <laughs> anyway, um, 
Fucking, oh my God. Ah, oh, Lebowski saw genius. Fucking genius. And then also um, the way they did fan service, but also built it into really good comedy. Like the, I could do this all day. I know. Oh, yeah. What a great line. Like, and that's America's ass. I mean, oh my God. Like so many quotables. So great. <laughs> so good. I was just exhilarated and giggling throughout the entire film. Yeah. Um, to come on to Lebowski Thor, um, I thought it was really funny, and I'm a, obviously I'm a huge fan of the Big Lebowski, but I kind of didn't like what they did with Thor's character in this film. I thought it was kind of cheap, and there were obviously emotional moments with his character, like when he sees his mum. That's that was amazing. That was like that was so powerful, but uh, he was so. He was so, he was such a tragic hero in, in Infinity War, and he is still now. Like he is depressed, like he should be. But they could have actually done that, I think, non comedically, and that would have been fantastic because it would have, it just would have been so interesting to see Thor essentially descend deeper and deeper into this depression after he realizes that revenge is just meaningless. I don't know. I wasn't a huge fan. But it was funny. I, I completely disagree with you. I I think that... Okay, I have two points to make. One, I do see like you wanting kind of a like compelling, kind of sad tragedy for thing. And I, I get that. And I think we kind of got that in Infinity War. Like, that film was him being really sad for two hours, pretty much. And trying to make it up and failing, which was great. And here, I just think it would have been totally weird if it was really serious in all the Thor scenes. Um, and I really liked the comedy they built in. And I think that I'm probably letting it off the hook because I did think Lebowski th- Thor was so funny. But I do think that it worked with his arc overall amazingly. So, for example, when Infinity War came out, a big problem I had was I felt like they went back on Thor's arc. So, in Ragnarok, the whole point was he didn't need the hammer. He didn't need this external validation that he was a hero. He could just be a hero. And I, I think in Infinity War, I felt like they kind of went back on that with him obsessing over getting the hammer back. But in retrospect, with Endgame, I kind of see that obsession over getting the hammer back um, it's kind of him actually failing as a person. And in Endgame, he finally is told by his mother, it's okay, just be, you can succeed by just being yourself, not being what's expected of you. Not being what you're supposed to be, I think is the line. And that is like, honestly, one of the most beautiful sentiments from this whole franchise. And um, it really moved me. Uh, and it was a perfect ending to Thor's uh, arc. I mean, this is the character who is literally royal lineage, and his arc is rejecting that and accepting himself and loving himself. And um, this film's got a lot of shit for uh, apparently fat shaming. Personally, I don't think it really fat shamed. I think most of the jokes were alcoholic jokes. He had a beer belly. It wasn't like actual, like it wasn't like a an eating thing. It was more of an alcohol thing. And the moral of the film is like that he's fine, there's nothing wrong with him. Uh, and I, I really thought that was really beautiful, so, I, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I actually, I do see what you mean. Um, I do actually see what they mean about fat shaming. It felt kind of gratuitous at points. Like, the low camera angles where it was literally just, look how big his belly is, and Thor fat, lol. Especially with the whole Big Lebowski thing, like, the Big Lebowski wasn't fat, he was just a slacker. Um, yeah, so I do see what they mean, but it wasn't a huge problem for me. Uh, but yeah, every other character I think was handled incredibly well. Like, Hawkeye, um, Hawkeye really turned around, like, there, there's some memes of, memes of him, like, back in the day, but, like... It, like and just how he doesn't do shit basically but i mean even in age of ultron he was pretty interesting there and in in this one especially too he's just broken and incredibly violent and dark oh my god it was so interesting i'll be honest i don't remember anything from ultron apart from 
the lizard king. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but our boy Spader. The oh my god! Okay, so this is my story of how Endgame started for me. So Infinity War ended right, and there was like thirty minutes of kind of silence and black screen while we all waited for Endgame to start. Everyone's going toilet. Everyone's buying more snacks. You know how it goes. Um, so I'm waiting for Endgame, and I kind of fall asleep for five minutes, and I'm woken up by the sound of the film starting. And I'm <laughs> extremely excited for the film, so this is a big moment for me. And the opening scene, Jesus fucking Christ. The way they portray the family dusting away, but it's like, you miss the actual dusting, and you just see like a slight remnant of dust, and it's all silent. <laughs> Oh my god, it was gorgeous. Um, and it's another example of like, okay, a criticism that's been brought up is that if Thanos dusted everyone in Africa when it was daytime, <laughs> then it wouldn't be daytime in America where oh. Hawkeye is, it would be nighttime. Oh. Oh. And, okay, yeah, this is true. Okay, sure. But emotionally, this is such a powerful moment and a very rare example of like doing horror in daytime well if that makes sense like that's really rare and i think that was just a superb way to open possibly the biggest film of all time i mean i can't believe there was so much care put into making this effective they could have just thrown Thanos on the screen for two hours and like iron man doing stuff but like they really went out of the way to make every single character complex and interesting and, and lovable yeah it's it's a truly horrifying moment and i think it, what it really does well is just show you the wider context of the dusting and that's that's what this film does incredibly well as well is just showing you the devastation that it's had on the world which i was so pleased with it was actually one of my main worries going into the film that uh, I was just really hoping that they do show a world devastated by this. Obviously, logistically, it'll be a huge disruption. But just in terms of showing a world broken down, not because it's run out of people, but just it just feels emotionally de defeated. That was incredibly powerful. And actually something a lot of post-apocalyptic films don't do very well. Um, so for, you know, a Marvel movie, you know, the, one of the biggest movies ever to be doing it better than a lot of other films. It's a huge achievement. And yeah, you're right, they could have just slapped a lot more f action into this, but yeah, I really like where they went with this film. Yeah. One more character to talk about. Hulk. Hulk was the funniest thing about this film. The, the scene Ooh. that I laughed the hardest was <laughs> was the, his introduction scene. <laughs> Oh my god! Bro, Hulk fucking dad. Oh god! <laughs> it was so surreal. Like, I, I genuinely thought um, that, like, during that scene, he would just go like they would. Just, they would just say, "That's stupid. Stop it," and he'll go back to normal. But no, he just carries on for the whole scene, <laughs> being this perfect hybrid of like of ridiculously uh stupid hulk and uh genius scientist bruce banner and it is absolutely hilarious because he's like a jock scientist and, <laughs> and then he's like trying to get the kids to take a photo with ant-man and then he's like no no this kid wants to take a photo with you and then oh <laughs> it's so fucking funny oh, Look, i'm happy you brought up hulk because that was actually one of my main issues with this film. Uh, I fucking, I agree with you. I fucking love the comedy of Hulk. Like, everything you described was hilarious for me. I loved Mark Ruffalo's performance. It was perfect. Um, but with Hulk, like, I was a bit... Especially, like, I was watching some clips from Ragnarok uh, of, like, Talking Hulk. And I felt like what was really well established in Ragnarok and Infinite Infinite War was the sense that Hulk and Banner were two different people. Um, and this is like a thing in the comics as well, as I assume. Um, and I, I thought that... I, I wish in, in Endgame when he was Hulk all the time, they did a better job at like synthesizing 
the characteristics of Hulk and Banner to show that this is two people becoming one, whereas it really just felt like Banner in the Hulk body, if that makes sense. Which is sad, because I, I really felt like in Endgame, I mean, sorry, in Ragnarok, um, especially the moment when Hulk says, you like Banner more than me, and Thor's like, no, I don't. I, I Banner's boring, and numbers and stuff, you're my favorite. It, you really get the sense that Hulk is a separate person who cares about stuff, right? And I, I, it's kind of sad to see the death of Hulk in this film. I wish he was his characteristics were implemented more with the kind of Hulk, Professor Hulk, we'll call him, I guess. <laughs> but, but still, hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I don't have many opinions on it past the comedy, but I would say that he probably has the least satisfying character Hulk in the film as well. Like he actually basically doesn't have one. Um, mm. Obviously, he has a lot of tragic moments, specifically when he, he just says to uh, Clint, like, I tried to bring Scarlett Johansson back, but I just couldn't. But overall, I feel like he kind of got screwed, actually. Like, every other Avenger has a kind of satisfying ending, whereas you kind of get nothing here. He's sort of um, like like a backdrop to Captain America's ending. I mean, fucking, like uh falcon gets a better ending than hulk does in this film and that yeah that was kind of harsh especially since uh mark ruffalo hasn't um got on a got on a solo film uh throughout the whole time and actually um in terms of just the actors i actually he's one of my favorites he's like up there with downey and uh hemsworth for me like i he's he's so great um so yeah, that was that was kind of sad for me. Do you feel the same way? I agree, and I think this really came through in the not doing a great job at showing how him and Hulk kind of came to terms with each other as two different people. It instead kind of showed him very simplistically, kind of just becoming the Hulk forever. Uh, it, it really was just Banner in the Hulk's body, and it was kind of disrespectful to the the kind of trajectory they've been building for the character. And I agree, like, he didn't really get, like, a great moment in the film, really. Like, it was kind of odd. He got, like, really good comedic moments, but, yeah. I really hope you get... I mean, I'm kind of done with the MCU now after this film. I don't really want to see, like, Spider-Man and all that shit. But I'd love to see, like, a Hulk film if they put that out at some point. That could bring me back. Because, um, yeah, I agree. His performance is great. He definitely deserves more. So do you want to get onto time travel? Um, what I what I realized we haven't really talked about is essentially these two films' most significant moments, um, mm. which would be both the snap and the return. And okay. I just like to say that I think both of these things are perfectly executed. The snap is so um, visceral and distressing, and really having had it spoiled for me, was just so so much more impactful than even I ever hoped it could be. There's one detail that I really liked about it was essentially the way people would like, as parts of them would fade away, they, they, you know, they wouldn't just cloud into ash all at once, like they'd fall over. I think the first character you actually see turn to dust is Bucky and like his leg falls. And so he falls over and hits the ground and turns into ash. And that was, God, it's, that's horrible. Like that, like kids are going to see this, that fucking hell. It, it's so visceral and it goes on for such a long time, but just, just long enough that it doesn't ever lose impact. It's so bleak and somber and distressing. God. I totally, I totally agree. Like, uh, I, I've, it's weird. I, I did kind of forget how impactful the snap was for me the first time I watched it. Because the first time I watched it, there was an inkling that maybe they could end this with everyone dying, but they wouldn't do that, right? Like, you know, I know it'd be temporary, but that'd be a weird ending. And then it just did. And I was like, whoa. And I totally agree. Like, uh, upon rewatch, the one I really appreciated the most, it wasn't played out the most, but it was my favorite kind of death was I think it was like, um, oh yeah, War Machine's looking for Sam, uh, Birdman, what's his name? Falcon. 
<laughs> yeah, he's looking for Falcon, and uh, Fa- we see Falcon dissipate, and then War Machine's like, Sam, where are you? And he doesn't see it. And it's a sense of, like, something incomprehensibly horrible has happened that we actually just don't can't fathom, right? And it's this mode of him looking for a friend that is literally dust. He can't find him. That was really powerful for me. Uh, and the sound effect and the use of silence in the score, it was completely silent, apart from the sound effect. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous, contemplative moment. Yeah, and God, when Spider Man. Okay, here's the big question: Was Spider Man's one overly uh, <laughs> emotionally manipulative? Because uh, especially from rewatch, it took him significantly longer to turn into dust <laughs> than everyone else. Like we saw him slowly disintegrate while like fucking. Birdman just went in like a second. I I don't really mind too much. Um, just because, yeah, like thematically, what it does for Tony's character is like he's he's a father figure for his character. Like it does go on much longer, but the fact that it kind of comes at the end uh, of it all, uh, it made me mind a lot less. Like it kind of was less of a harsh juxtaposition and. God, it's nothing really Spider-Man says, but when 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 Tony's holding him and he just says, you're okay, you're okay, and he's just trying so hard to believe that this isn't what's happening. Fucking, like, God, I get chills thinking about it. It's so horrible. Another thing I want to bring up, in regards to Tom Holland's performance, uh, our favourite oh, hunky, twinky, little boy uh <laughs> is oh my god um so throughout like super of you never get a, few, a full sense of like how scary this that should be for human beings in, this, in these positions uh which is why like films like kick ass are so praised because they really show like how an actual person would react to these situations right and it's the moment when peter parker says i don't want to go and you realize this is just a 16 year old kid like and this is really fucked up. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it grounds it so incredibly. Yeah. It's such a desperate, like, last cry for life and just at the injustice of it that it's it just grounds it so much and forgets makes you forget that you're watching a film, basically. Sticking with Spider-Man as, like, a talking point, um, yeah, he wasn't really used well in Endgame, which is fine. I mean, it wasn't really about him. It was about the original Avengers. Um... One thing, one question I have that I wish was dealt with in Endgame because it kind of uh, made me feel weird after the film ended is I really fucking was happy after it ended. But like, okay, so it's established that five years have passed, right? Mm. Uh, and then at the end, we see Peter see his high school friend who still looks like he's in high school and, you know, they, they meet each other. They walk back into high school. But like, you know, like, is it like half of the high school class vanished and luckily Zendaya and his friend weren't that half and they are the same age? Has um are they still in high school? Did they did they do high what? Or is friends still in high school? Is I guess maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh I it does I know what you mean. That is one of the bigger logical inconsistencies, but I guess like Maybe everyone who got dusted, because they all didn't age, they all got like, you know, this was like a few weeks later and, and like they got put back into high school. So so h- him and all of his friends got dusted. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and okay. So now, like Spider-Man Far From Home, all the dustings happened perfectly to make that film line up. Can I just say, I think it's bullshit that uh, Marvel said that Far From Home was set before Endgame. I think that's bullshit. I think they just said that so that you couldn't act like Far From Home implies that Peter lives. I think it's literally bullshit. I'm always pretty confident in that. Um, and then yeah, to carry on talking about Spider Man. God, when he's brought back in this, that was such a joyous moment. That was so oh, just especially because of what it does for Iron Man's character and it, and sort of redeems him as a father figure. 
and kind of gives him validation for this entire thing. Like he may, while he may be putting his daughter's, uh, like his role as a father for his daughter at risk, he's fulfilled his role as a father to Peter Parker. Like, oh, that's amazing. That's so wonderful. In the midst of grand epic battle, we get such a tender character field moment. God bless this film. I totally agree. I really love the stuff with Tony's daughter. Um, I love with 3000, one of the adorable quotes of the entire year in cinema. I loved it. I love seeing him as a father and as a husband, and he's grown so much. I'm getting emotional just talking about it. Uh, but uh, there's two camps of the endgame opinion, kind of. Yeah. Uh, well, three, really. The first is, I'm too cool to care. Look at me. I watch. Uh, fucking a24 movies okay uh and <laughs> the second is um kind of um the middle part was really good and the end was dumb like the big battle what? and then the, the third is the end part was really good but the middle was dumb because time travel lol uh these are the three camps uh i actually really like uh both parts of the film um and with the time travel stuff what i really like about it is what people are, I think people are missing the point of it. It wasn't about how they're going to get the Infinity Stones to beat Thanos. It was about how are we going to resolve everyone's arc, right? So in Black Widow's time travel story, we have her redeeming herself, right? For the atrocities that it's implied that she's done that maybe we'll see in the prequel. In Thor's arc, we have his, him confronting his mother and being allowed to just be himself instead of being thor the king all these things he's meant to be and tony's which is possibly my favorite um him confronting his father jesus christ this whole series he's had these huge father issues and you know like seeing him talk to his dad and give his dad parenting advice we see how much he's grown how much he's accepted his father um I just and Downey Jr.'s performance in that moment was so nuanced and gorgeous and mature and both childlike. Oh my god! I I thought it was such a genius, genius way to use a kind of dumb sci-fi plot contrivance to perfectly wrap up symbolically everyone's arc. I, I really adored it. While I don't have a inherent problems with the time travel stuff and like. I did like a lot of stuff about it, like the cap v cap fight when, yeah, the line of like, <laughs> what what's the line? Sorry, when I can do this all day. I can do this all day. Yeah, I know that was so funny. Um, I just, uh, I didn't find it that engaging. Um, again, I think that's why I was kind of hoping for the or missing the Infinity War level stakes for me because, yeah, while it was more character driven. Um, I just didn't feel that engaged in what the characters were actually participating in, um, which I know isn't really the point, but then also I feel like the film maybe could have done a little bit more to get me more engaged in their character arcs in those moments. Um, I think that's a totally fair criticism, but I kind of think the film is really smart in it knew that we knew that we're smart enough to know that they're going to win in the end so they're not going to hedge all of the tension on who oh, will they win who knows instead they kind of go the route of let's just enjoy what this was let's have a fun light-hearted adventure romp so you can just say goodbye to your favorite characters you can just have these fun light-hearted moments like when they confront the doppelgangers um and they find a way to incorporate everything that was good about the MCU. For example, um, even though it's one of the less popular films, I like Iron Man 3, and I really liked the stuff of Tony being intuitive. Oh, Iron Man was pretty good, yeah. Yeah, I liked the stuff of him being Iron Man about the suit, right? And we got that in this film. We got him being a spy, and we got to see how far Cap has come from kind of the rigid, stuffy version of him. He had an Ultron. to the one here that accepts his sexualization with the That's America's Ass? I, I, I know I can see your criticism that there's not much tension, but personally, I'm grateful that they didn't pretend that we thought they could actually lose in this film. And they just had fun. with It was basically like a, a highlight reel of the saga without feeling like a waste of time, for me at least. Um, so I actually I actually liked the lighthearted tone the middle of the film took. I liked the adventurous time travel vibe. 
Mm, totally. And and again, the comedy was much better here as well. So that really helps as w- uh, keep it going. And while, yeah, there was no tension, that didn't mean that when they do eventually succeed, it wasn't rewarding. God, when they succeed in this film... Hey, Maddie. It is... Yeah? On your left. Oh, <laughs> honestly, I will never forget that moment. That moment was 11 years in the making, and it was amazing. Re- honestly rivals um retu- the return of the king ending moments i think it's up there it's like it had me clapping and cheering in the cinema along with everyone else it was ah oh, i'm i was i'm gushing it was it was obscenely gratifying and amazing and everyone's reactions to it was so beautiful Oh, what a moment. I think one thing that was miraculous in this film is, like you said before, like the MCU had been really tedious at points. And an example, and this film just makes me like, it literally gave me rose tinted glasses about what the MCU had been because it's such, so well done. Like, for example, uh, Doctor Strange, I thought was kind of a lackluster, lackluster film. I don't like it that much. But when Tilda Swinton showed up, holy fucking shit, I got so excited. And when the army of magicians showed up, like, damn. Oh, man, there was so many great stuff. Like, remember the the, the uh, Pegasus? Valkyrie. Oh, so good. So good. It's so good. Yeah, I love this film. Okay, so we're approaching the end of the podcast, but before we do that, what do you think about the uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the Fortnite and the dab? Oh. I will say, I had two things bought for me for Endgame, and it was time travel and Fortnite. I genuinely didn't believe that there was actually... I thought the, the I saw a comment of like, wow, I can't believe there was a joke about Thanos playing about um four playing Fortnite and I was like that that's a meme that that's not actually in the film <laughs> and it fucking was and yeah what what do you what do you think about it? Oh um uh, my friend our friend Finley um <laughs> made it did it basically did a like spoilers with no context thing for me. He was like they all sit down and play Fortnite and I was like yeah you're shitting me of course that doesn't fucking happen um and yeah and so when it came to the moment in the cinema he just turned to me and looked me right in the fucking eye and i was like i told you um oh you know part of me should really fucking care part of me should be really upset about fortnite because it was like referenced twice and so and in so many of the shots in that scene you could see like high res fortnite happening (laughs) in the background on this old tv Oh, um, the the Hulk dabbing, okay, that's kind of fucking, like, funny in terms of, like, a visual thing, like, a visual thing that's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> this like, middle, like, hybrid between a green monster and a man fucking hitting a dab <laughs> to some kids, that's so funny. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I fucking defend these choices a hundred percent. Um I I think people talk about films aging themselves and dating themselves. And guess what? It doesn't fucking matter. Because why do we love all these eighties nostalgic films? Because they are dated, because they reference things that are dated, right? And I think that we have to accept we live in a world of Fortnite and dabbing, and we can't go back. We can't pretend that these didn't happen. And I really love this idea of this film as like a time capsule. Like, this was the biggest film of 2019. And in 30 years' time, we could explain this is what it was like in 2019, you know? Like, I, I, I really love it. And I don't think the film... I think the film... <laughs> Similar to eighth grade with Bo Burnham, like dabbing has become a joke in itself. So I don't think the film's doing it like, look, we're hip and cool. It's like, haha, dabbing's dumb. It, it's fine. And the yeah. Fortnite thing, it wasn't, I, it's funny, there was like actual footage of the game, but it wasn't gratuitous. It was very like, what would an alcoholic slacker loser do? 
play Fortnite. I mean, it, it's a really funny joke. Like, it, it's well integrated. It wasn't like Iron Man's daughter's playing Fortnite. It was there's no joke there. It's just like, look, it's Fortnite. It's like they generally really well integrated it into the joke and the great bit about how Korg is playing, but every now and then he gets the god of thunder to make fun of twelve year old kids for him. Like it's a great joke and uh yeah, no, I just wanted to get your reaction about the fact that it was in the film. I didn't really give a shit about your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> also, I love you, I'm like, sorry. I love you too, it's okay. I don't think you should not include uh, contemporary humour in your film just because in 10 or 20 years it, people won't get it. Like, I just, like, the film is also being released today. Like, it will still have an impact today doesn't matter like who really cares if there's one joke in a film or a few jokes in a film that don't age very well because it's not released in its uh time because it's not you're not seeing it in its time period it might not it might be made for its time period that's absolutely fine films are a product of their time yeah no one goes back and watches iron man and be like oh it was good but like the part where they mentioned myspace really just ruined the film for me like it i just, <laughs> I just couldn't believe that 2008 happened you know like it just really hurt my experience like no one gives a shit like yeah just turn your brain off for a second it's fine i think it's fitting the last thing we say about these films is a dab and Fortnite. um 100 this whole <laughs> film was a dab and Fortnite, but like really good so to get <laughs> To give my final thoughts, um, what an amazing wrap up to 11 years this has been. I couldn't be more happy with the way this turned out. It was heartfelt, it was entertaining, and it was caring. And it was just able to carry me at every moment. And I'm so grateful for this time. Um, People complain about Marvel ruining cinema and just being incredibly mediocre. And like for a time, I didn't, obviously I don't think it was ruining cinema, but I thought, I thought it was overdone and dumb. But blockbusters have been going on for as, almost as long as cinema. And it, what the MCU has done has provided a consistent amount of quality. And now while this saga comes to a close, what they've done is they remind us that there's people working on these films that care and also that there's loads of millions of people that are watching these films and care and i don't care if people feel like that's misplaced there are people that are watching there's millions and millions of people that are watching these and care and that's amazing that's amazing there are millions of people watching films and that are invested in them and will spend money to go and see it that's fantastic and this is a wonderful achievement in cinema. I'm so happy. First of all, I highly recommend this. I love this Endgame and Infinity War. This kind of kind of has become more of an Endgame review than Infinity War, but anyway, um, I love both of them. And when we discuss cinema, we have this tendency to kind of uh, glorify independent smaller films over big films. And I think that I think that. Both can be done really well, and they can't really be compared to each other in a meaningful way. We we'll both have to overcome a very different obstacle. So I think Endgame and Infinity will both really are exemplar examples of how to do a blockbuster with heart. You know, I mean, I, I think this is as impactful as the shit that Cameron was doing, James Cameron was doing in the eighties. Honestly, uh, in terms of like scope and emotion. Uh, this was really touching, moving stuff. I was bowled over by these films. I was really won over. And one thing that makes it so spectacular is watching these, they honestly are a completely different tier from everything else in the MCU. Like, it makes you feel like the MCU was actually great. No, it was really mediocre and dumb. But these films are, like, completely just fucking extraordinary, you know? They're, they're an exception to the... Uh, the rule, honestly, and and I really think it's um, I really just want to give them their due praise. And this kind of thing is it's rare. It's rare that you get a huge crowd piece of blockbuster that's actually well thought out and good. Um, and I I think that should be applauded. Um, people often kind of talk about like mainstream cinema being dull in reference to films like what like uh, you know. 
Fast and Furious, R.I.P.D., um, that new fucking Men in Black film, Hellboy, those kind of films, right? Um, but but what we need, if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna like slaughter all of these shitty kind of like you know, fucking, what's that film with animals in it that's animated? <laughs> the, where they sing? Is it called Sing? Yeah, if if we're gonna lampoon shit like that. We need to praise fucking mainstream films like this to actually give a shit and do, like, good. <laughs> My English went down the drain there, but I just, yeah, I really enjoyed this and I highly recommend it. And I don't think we should be cynical about it because it's popular. I think this is genuinely just a really great film. No, exactly. That uh, I would have to try so hard to be cynical about these films. That would take a superhuman amount of effort. You're right, we should, if we are going to complain about mainstream films, and, you know, me and you, we do complain about a lot of mainstream films, but when things like this come around, we must sing their praises. I'm, like, hesitant to call this our generation Star Wars because um, I think that, like, I don't think we'll ever get anything like Star Wars again, and I don't think we'll ever get anything like this again. And that's why it's so fantastic. This is so clearly a product of our time and we will never get anything like that if i'm if i'm honest with you i really do think this is in a way our generation star wars is too kind of specific it's our generation's franchise every decade has a star wars a harry potter a lord of the rings where the final film just breaks the box office and like everyone in the fucking world watches it and it's a it's an event right and i really do think endgame is the equivalent of that it is our definitely it was not all but it's this decade's definitely how it's part two it's this decade's return of the jedi it it it, it really is that kind of this decade will be remembered for this franchise putting it off right at the end and um, yeah, I don't think calling it our Star Wars is that far of a stretch. I, I, I think Endgame is better than Return of the Jedi, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I do think that's a fair comparison to make. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so that wraps it up for this discussion, and it wraps it up for the MCU. So yeah, I believe Josh has some music to recommend. All right, so we've done two consecutive movie episodes. Uh, so now we have to catch up with the music. So we're going to have two consecutive music episodes to pick up for it. Uh, so next week, while we're talking about music, um, the new albums we're covering are Grey Area by the British rapper Little Sims. Are you familiar with her music? I'm not. I'm not. All right, awesome. Well, uh, look forward to discussing the album. And also... <laughs> We're gonna. I'm sorry if I'm bumping my mic a lot. Um, we're gonna discuss <laughs> uh, Billy Eilish's new album. When we all fall asleep, where do we go? Are you oh, familiar with Billy Eilish? Um, yeah, I've heard. I mean, obviously, I've seen her around, and I, yeah, I've heard she has a new album. Or she has an album. It's super interesting. You picked that. Okay. I'm a bit upset because I decided to do this album before it came out because I was like, okay, we're going to fucking talk about Billie Eilish when she drops her album because that's going to be controversy. But it's been getting fucking like good reviews from popular channels like Anthony <laughs> Fantano yeah. and I'm pissed off because I wanted it to be like, a, you'd be like, grrr, music. Um, but now like people have accepted it's fine, so it's not as exciting and controversial. But whatever, it's going to be interesting to talk about. Anyway, um, oh, yeah. who knows? Maybe we'll both hate it. Uh, you have to tune in next week to find out. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. Um, and for the classic, not classic, but um, edit me saying classic. Fuck that. Uh, for the old album that we're doing, uh, Father John Misty's "I Love You, Honey Bear." Are you familiar? Oh, whoa! You're crazy. Are you yeah. familiar with this album? Only from you. Only from you. Well, we're gonna. F- fucking talk about it so oh, shit. get ready Woo! it's gonna be good i'm really excited for this episode and uh, yeah it's gonna be awesome all right thanks man so yeah that wraps up for the podcast um thank you so much for listening we really appreciate it and tune in next time to hear us talk about those wonderful albums
Well, Maddie, I think we ticked all the boxes, so it's about time we left. It is indeed. Should we end the episode with a, with a, a, a click? A click? Like a, like a Thanos snap? Hell yeah, let's snap this podcast out. All right. Thanks for listening. Three, two, one. That was probably really out of time. Bye. Underwhelming. <laughs>